Hey everyone. On this channel, I tend to discuss bad reality shows, but this month, I thought I'd switch things up a bit by talking about a show that I actually love. My Cat from Hell is a show on Animal Planet where cats with behavior issues are rehabilitated. Now, if you've never heard of this show, and especially if it doesn't sound like something you'd be interested in, I want you to try to guess the kind of person who hosts a show like this. Really think about it, pause the video and close your eyes if you want to, then come back when you're ready. You got it? Well, if you didn't picture a rockabilly street magician, then you were dead wrong. This guy, who looks like the villain in an Airbud movie about bowling, is named, get ready for this, Jackson Galaxy. Like, just take a look at how this show opens. I'm Jackson Galaxy. I'm a musician by night and a cat behaviorist by day. I cannot stress enough that this isn't an obscure David Cross character and is in fact a real guy with a real show. And I'm not alone in thinking that this is wild. At the beginning of each episode, the owners of the cat that he's going to work with make a point of saying how surprised they are by what Jackson looks like. Jackson is totally not what I expected. How you doing, hey, man? Jackson. Garrett. Hey, Garrett. Garrett this is my girlfriend, Hi. Jenny. Hey, Jenny. Hi. Good to meet you. Wow. I was expecting someone more conservative. I don't know that I had any preconceived notions, but when Jackson walked through the door, that's not what I would have preconceived. But also, it's often not in the way that I would expect. Hi. Hey, Hannah. I'm Jackson. Hi, nice to meet you. Come nice on in. Nice to meet in. you. Jackson was definitely not what I expected when I opened the door. I don't think I was expecting somebody who was so hip. Like, there's a lot that I'll say about Jackson's appearance, but I definitely wouldn't exactly call the guy who looks like the one way too old member of every 2000s boy band hip. I also love how he keeps all of his equipment, which is just stuff like toys, cat treats, as well as a black light for when he needs to do a forensic investigation of where the cat is peeing. We have to approach this from a CSI perspective of leaving no stone unturned. All of this stuff is kept in his guitar case because of course it is. Now, while Jackson is wild, so are the owners of the cats that he works with in a way that only people who went on a reality show in the 2000s can be. I'm Brian. And I'm Corey. We met when I was working at a restaurant and Brian came in every day for five weeks. <laughs> One really funny part is there's a guy who collects figurines and makes a big point of saying that they aren't toys, but then for the entire show, everyone else just calls them his toys. Uh, she destroys things. These figurines over here, they're all limited edition. These aren't regular toys. This is my suggestion for you. Cool. You value these toys a lot, I know that. I covered this with clear acrylic. Oh, right, there you go. Kid right. proof, right? So now Sean's happy, and, uh, everyone can see his toys. Yep. Or in the first ever episode, one of the owners says that he's a dog person, and then the editor, who I can only assume is a cat, edits it to make him look really sinister, complete with a black and white picture of him with a dog. I have never been a cat person. I always grew up with dogs. Not only did I not ever have cats, I never got along well with cats. But then also, He's actually kind of a huge asshole to this cat, but because he doesn't understand how cats work, there's just moments like this. He tries to discipline her like a dog, and it doesn't work. This is a punishment! That guy really sucks, though. At one point, Jackson brings out one of those, like, cans of compressed air with a motion sensor to train the cat not to go into the owner's bedroom. There's a tool that I really like to use. It's a motion-activated air blaster, and I use it as a learning device, not as a punishment. So, all it does, when the electric eye picks it up, it blasts out some air. And the guy gets really weirdly stoked because he finally has a way to punish his cat. It should come right about to here, and there it goes. Oh, that's so okay. cool. And try to lure her over. I can't wait. The air blaster is Awesome. That same couple also complains that their cat pees everywhere, but then Jackson sees that they also just don't change the litter. Wow, that is one nasty litter box. If the litter box is right here, there's a sink right here, and a cat is choosing to pee in the sink, that's because the litter box is not a very attractive place. 
By the way, this isn't exactly relevant, but I need to show you this clip. Now I'm gonna get gross on you guys. Yeah. I'm stick my hand in here. I get a little bit of grief sometimes for feeling pee and poo. I'm sorry, they're giving you grief? That actually sounds like a very tame reaction if you're regularly sticking your bare hands in litter boxes. Like, I get that there are contexts where that would make sense to do, but it didn't even seem necessary in this episode. Like, the cat wasn't sick or having any diet problems that would require Jackson to look at its stools. It kind of just seemed like Jackson was looking for an excuse to feel some cat shit. Now, let me tell you about this video's sponsor, Skillshare. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the transition. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes taught by people with real-world, relevant experience. Uh, so, something about me is that I'm one of those people who was recently diagnosed with ADHD and now can't shut up about it. A lesser-known side effect of the medication is thinking that literally everything that you do is an ADHD thing and talking about that to anyone who will listen. Yeah, getting diagnosed just explains so much. Like, before, I never knew why sometimes I would dream in black and white, but now, oh, sorry, iced Americano and a chocolate chip cookie, please. Anyway, where was I? But while being medicated rules, it doesn't solve everything. And so the hard part has been trying to learn ways of getting things done that actually work for me. That's where I found Skillshare really helpful. They have a lot of different courses about productivity. I'll be honest, some of them were very much not right for me, but others really clicked. Everyone's brain is different, but they're all beautiful. Skillshare is also great for anyone interested in learning skills that could give you new creative outlets like painting, graphic design, or photography, as well as more professionally oriented things like web design, marketing, and real jobs like YouTube or podcasting. I will personally say as a self-taught video editor, while there are so many amazing free tutorials out there, if you're starting from square one, it really is so helpful just to have that kind of baseline knowledge that you get from a basic class that teaches you the proper way to do everything right from the beginning. The free tutorials are great anytime you need to look up something complicated, but they aren't as good at teaching you all of the basics. Case in point, I'd been doing this for about two years before I learned what a ripple delete is. And right now, Skillshare is giving the first thousand people to use the link in the description a one-month trial for free. Plus, in the spirit of sharing skills, I'm gonna throw in a completely free tip for anyone thinking of getting into making YouTube videos. Stay out of my way. Anyways, thanks so much to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. They don't root around in litter boxes, but they won't give you any grief if you do. <laughs> Click that link in the description to get one month for free and support the channel a little bit while you're at it. Coming back to Jackson Galaxy, something I find fascinating, which is extremely rare in reality shows, is that the spectacle of the show doesn't just come from Jackson's absurd drip, but the empathy that he shows to the cats he's helping. He regularly emphasizes that the goal of his work is much less to train the cats than to train their owners. I always remind myself that part of my job is to help cat guardians recognize where their own actions feed into feline bad behaviors. And I, I really want to approach her all the time and I have to like restrain myself because I don't want to stress her out. One of the things I'm most impressed about with Karay was her ability to admit her failings as an emotional being. Sometimes I find the problem I'm dealing with is much more human than feline. His response to a cat climbing on furniture isn't to train the cat to stop, but instead to get the owners to understand that climbing is a legitimate need that the cat has, and they need to give it things to climb. Now what I'm seeing up here, guys, of cat heaven, this is how a cat should see the world. Powerful, secure, confident. At some points, I do think that it's a little bit much. Like, he'll demand that they make pretty expensive changes to where they live. One of the things that I'm not seeing here mm -hmm. is any place for her to perch, any place for her to get some vertical distance from the floor. We're gonna cut to the chase on this one. I wanna open up this area. So we're gonna use this bookcase, and I wanna see steps. A little mini shelf here, a little mini shelf up there. 
And then when they don't do it, cause like, I don't know, not everyone has the time or money to drop everything to install cat shelves ASAP, Jackson gets really pissed at them. I'm noticing what I don't notice. I still don't see shelving. I still don't see access to up there. Tell me what's going on here. So we've looked. We've looked for different types of shelves and uh... By the time I get back here next week, he has to be able to get up to the shelves. He has to be able to get up above, down again. There is no tomorrow on this one. Nonetheless, I think that the empathy Jackson shows embodies a vision of restorative justice that runs completely contrary to the punitive model which is so frequently employed at just every level of our society from the criminal justice system right down to the treatment of misbehaving animals. And this is intentional, for no small part to serve the interests of the ne- And this is intentional, for no small part to serve the interest of the neoliberal state apparatus. I can't do this. It really seems like things only get worse, doesn't it? I wrote this after an all-nighter on the day after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade and is likely to also make another ruling this week preventing the EPA from doing anything about climate change. It's also my birthday. And while on a personal level the last two months haven't been great for me, uh, some personal issues combined with the burnout that I've been dealing with for a while now, as well as just the state of the world, uh, led to me feeling like shit and my head being bad, as you can probably tell. <laughs> Now, personally, whenever I'm not feeling so hot, I like to take care of myself by just setting aside a few hours and doing this little relaxation exercise that I think I actually like invented, where what I'll do is I just sit back and switch between refreshing the same three social media apps over and over again until around 4 a.m. I call this self-care. Not to go all damn kids and their smartphones here, but it is honestly kind of wild being in that state and realizing just how perfect social media is for worsening your mental health. Everything you see is just bad news or people doing better than you, which really is just another kind of bad news. This obviously isn't a particularly novel observation. They should call it anti-social media, am I right, folks? We even know from the Facebook leaks that they're actually facing a morale problem over there as more and more of their employees come to realize that history will remember them as monsters. Don't worry though, Facebook takes mental health very seriously, and so now they're actually cracking down on any employees caught reading Hannah Arendt's report on the banality of evil. But while social media does certainly play a role in making us think everything is bad, as well as in actually making those things bad in a lot of cases, this isn't going to be a video arguing that everything is fine actually. Just limit your screen time and stay off social media. <laughs> Might as well tell people to exercise and quit smoking while they're at it. Now, things are genuinely very bad and have been getting worse for, I don't know, the last 30, 40 years, maybe longer, and it doesn't feel to me like anything is going to improve for a very long time. Again, I'll freely admit to a bit of a bias on account of my brain being mean to me, but I don't think I'm alone in this. It feels like everyone on all points of the political spectrum feels this inevitable sense of collapse. It just feels impossible to stay even remotely informed without being overwhelmed by this absolute hopelessness as like the jaws of this methodically laid steel trap close in around us from every angle. It's almost a cliche at this point, well before this latest catastrophe, it's just a general vibe that everything is falling apart. 
And then that feeling is just magnified by how every liberal with access to institutional power is completely useless in the face of rising fascism. Americans just lost their right to get an abortion and Nancy Pelosi read a poem and asked for donations. Conservatives are openly calling for violence against trans and LGBTQ plus people. If I was a parent and my fifth grade daughter had had to sleep and shower in some kind of cabin at some summer camp that I paid money to send my child to, and there was a man calling himself a woman sleeping in her cabin, my husband would have beat him into the ground. They are underqualified to have children. They should have their children taken away from them because it's child abuse. The LGBT transgender grooming our children's minds is a national security threat. We need to hold people for treason, start having some public hearings, and start executing people who are found guilty for their treasonous acts. And Hillary Clinton is out there saying that the Democrats need to stop caring about niche issues like trans people in the interest of winning elections. Sorry trans people, it's nothing personal. Hillary just doesn't think that you're a winning issue. And no one knows how to win an election quite like Hillary Clinton. And it's not just politicians either. Oh my fucking god, I can't listen to another person saying how shit just got real. It's time to roll up our sleeves and vote even harder. People are out in the streets getting tear gassed at protests and the libs are calling them Republican instigators, which Honestly, I can kind of see the logic there, like, they're doing something effective. There's no way that they're Democrats. Those bastards overturned Roe v. Wade? Well, let's just say that I wouldn't want to be in their shoes once SNL gets done with them. We don't need to storm the Capitol, okay? Our January 6th happens every Saturday night, and it comes with a musical guest. Also, holy shit, the way these people talk about voting. Don't get me wrong, I've voted in every election that I've ever been able to, even when it doesn't matter because of where I live. That said, particularly in America, red states are so gerrymandered at this point that it's effectively impossible to just vote our way out of this. At this point, saying I'm against- Oh, Jackie. Sorry for yelling. It's okay. I'm just angry at my phone. At this point, saying that I'm against electoralism is like saying someone getting out to walk because their car broke down is against driving. And of course, these are just a few issues out of the endless barrage of nightmare scenarios unfolding constantly. I haven't even touched on war, inflation, the pandemic, or climate change. Hey, uh, anyone else notice how governments are warning about food and gas shortages and then upping the police budget? I wonder what that's about. I'm not trying to bum you out, but I think we need to be honest about where we're at and how we're feeling. That said, I'm also not a huge fan of just like posting those Instagram infographics saying, let this radicalize you rather than turn you to despair. Not because I disagree with them at all, but because I don't think bad shit happening is enough to get people to do anything. If anything, I think that more often when we don't have anywhere to channel that anger into action, we feel defeated and give up. Hell, as annoying as they are, I can understand people who think things will get better if we all just vote super hard this time. It's better than just thinking that things won't get better. The problem, as I see it, isn't a lack of righteous anger, but an inability, and in some cases an unwillingness, to imagine a better world that's actually worth fighting for. And so, in this video, I'm gonna talk about why utopianism is good, actually. I can't make any promises, but I can set you straight. In S.D. Trostowska's book, Utopia in the Age of Survival, she begins by laying out the question, 
In this hell world that we find ourselves in, how do we on the left keep fighting when the odds are completely stacked against us? As she puts it, The future might not belong to us after all. This we must grant. Given the distinct possibility that history is not on our side, why not give up? Why continue denouncing the world over the world's wrongs? Why insist, as in the old days when the future was a promise to us, that real change for the better is possible? The world to come must still be worth fighting for. No matter the actual odds of victory by the right side of history, which are low indeed. As long as the future is for us a prima facie value, we will not give up the little claim we have to it. What is more, we will fight without fail to get it right. She goes on to describe the current state of the left, using Walter Benjamin's term left-wing melancholy, which in his book by the same name, Enzo Traverso describes as the feeling that since the fall of the Berlin Wall, the rise of neoliberalism, and Francis Fukuyama's declaration of the end of history, there's been an inability, particularly on the left, but also just in general, to imagine a future. This is why, Traverso argues, culture is so nostalgic now, because without being able to imagine a future, all we can do is look back at the past. You can obviously see this with the rise of doomers, people who are primarily on the left, who you usually see online, because let's face it, they aren't leaving the house, posting about how futile politics are because they've essentially given up on things getting better. I don't think it's any coincidence that Capitalist Realism by Mark Fisher, a book that struggles with this very issue and doesn't really come to an optimistic conclusion, has become so emblematic. But also, I think that this explains a lot of the problems with mainstream liberal politics. A lot of this comes from neoliberalism. From the 80s onwards, as multinational corporations came to call the shots and states increasingly turned into tools of capital, politicians stopped saying that they would improve the world and instead moved towards promising to protect citizens from greater and greater threats. What we were left with was a politics where the highest goal is just efficiently managing society rather than changing it. I think that this is why people will claim that Donald Trump and Elon Musk aren't neoliberals. All of their economic views absolutely are neoliberal, but they both promise to improve the world, which is a surprisingly rare thing now. Coming back to left-wing melancholy now, to use a Freudian metaphor here, in his essay Mourning and Melancholia, Freud compared, you guessed it, mourning and melancholy. Freud argued that while both are reactions to loss, with mourning we can put that loss into words which lets us process our feelings and eventually heal. With melancholy, the feeling of loss gets stuck in the subconscious and so we still feel like shit, but because we can't articulate why, we can't get better. One of the key scholars in utopianism was a guy named Ernst Bloch. When most people think about utopianism, they think that that means imagining a perfect world. But Bloch instead used an extremely broad definition, arguing that imagining a utopia just means that you're imagining the world not as it is, but as it should be. Whether that means sci-fi space communism or just a stronger social safety net and access to abortion. Those both stemmed from the same very human urge. Bloch argued that the feeling at the root of all utopianism is longing, because the only way that longing can be articulated is by imagining it being fulfilled. If the problem we're facing now is left-wing melancholy, where since we can't articulate our loss, it's left to fester just below the surface, then I think that the solution might be to learn to articulate it through left-wing utopianism. Now, this is all getting a little bit dense and theoretical though, so let me slow down a bit and explain one of the more confusing concepts I've brought up so far. What the fuck is going on with Jackson Galaxy's facial hair? I think the most striking thing is that this is almost just a beard, but instead he shaved these two lines into it that separated into this weird mix of sideburns and a goatee that winds up really giving evil biker. I mean, first of all, imagine shaving that every day, trying to keep the lines perfectly straight, like, that's just your life. But also, in a sense, his facial hair is defined by what it lacks. The enigma of it lies in both the fact that there's just no name for whatever the fuck that is, 
but also because what defines it is purely the two thin strips that are missing. So first, let's look at what isn't working. I think one of the symptoms of this left-wing melancholy is a certain amount of cynicism towards earnestly engaging in politics. And to see why that's maybe not the best, let's turn to everyone's favorite Marxist philosophy raccoon, Slavoj Žižek. In his book, The Sublime Object of Ideology, Zizek makes some really interesting observations about cynicism. Also, sorry, I normally couch all this smart shit in something silly, but for this video, I read a bunch of books and now I'm gonna tell you about them. So if you know just one thing about Zizek's work, it's probably that he's extremely concerned with ideology. Now, when Zizek says ideology, he's using that word in the Marxist sense, i.e. structures and discourses that cause people to view the world in a distorted way. A good example that Marx used was medieval monarchism. So like, what makes a king a king? Well, having subjects to rule over who treat him as a king, right? But the thing is, those subjects don't think about it that way. They look at it backwards, thinking that the king has some special quality that makes them have to serve him. Essentially, they think that him being a king turns them into subjects instead of the truth, which is that them serving him is what turns him into a king. But in our modern society, we tend to think of ourselves as actually pretty aware of how these things work. Like, it's not even a particularly radical observation to understand the ways that capitalism is fucked. Not even just on the left. For example, one of the reasons I don't use Instagram much anymore is that I've completely fucked my algorithm by following a bunch of motivational quote pages that are just hilarious. <laughs> The main one is called Men With Quote, and they just post stuff like this. She asked me, what's your favorite position? I said CEO. But then I fell down the rabbit hole and oh my god, dude, it just gets so much weirder from here. For example, there's a ton of these accounts that are just dedicated to posting this exact same kind of thing, but over pictures of the Joker. From nothing to something. We came here from hard work, bro. But then one that really stands out is an account called Billionaire World, which makes a lot of posts that I would consider to be actually pretty scathing critiques of capitalism, but like as good things. Like they post stuff like this. My boss arrived at work in a new Ferrari. I said, wow, that's an amazing car. He replied, if you work hard, put all your hours in, and strive for excellence, I'll get another one next year. And are unironically just like, dope, that's really awesome that society works that way. But the fact that people are so aware of this has led some to think that we are actually in a time of post-ideology. Zizek instead argues that the people who think that are idiots. He brings up Pascal's wager, which for anyone who wasn't an edgy high school atheist, basically says to think about being religious as a bet. If you're a Christian and when you die it turns out atheists were right, well, you wasted a lot of Sundays that you could have spent sleeping in, maybe you could have had a more adventurous sex life and been a bit more fun at parties. On the other hand, if you're an atheist and it turns out Christians were right, well then you're fucked. <laughs> just being damned for all eternity, like... I'm sorry, an incel who's now on a watch list made some really good points in a debate in 2007! Now, this isn't a good argument for being a Christian. For one thing, it completely ignores all the harm that is caused by Christianity. It also presents a false dichotomy, not considering that you could be anything other than a Christian or an atheist. But Zizek points out that Pascal is actually saying something really interesting about belief here. Most people think of religious faith as something that you believe at the core of your being, not a thing that you could fake to min-max the afterlife. But Zizek says no, that's actually exactly how faith works. For him, belief is external. It's what you do. What you believe in your heart of hearts doesn't matter. If you spend your life pretending to be a Christian, then you're a Christian. In fact, 
arguably you're more devout if you do it that way. Like, if you obey a rule because you thought about it deeply and came to the logical conclusion that you support it, that's not obedience. Obedience is when you obey the rule even though you don't agree with it. In fact, real obedience is when you forget that the rule exists at all. For example, most of the people watching this are probably wearing clothes right now. Nudists can skip to this timestamp. But actually, why are you doing that? Even if you need to get dressed for work or to go outside, I'm willing to bet that you didn't make a conscious decision to get dressed today. You probably just did it because that's what people do. For Zizek, this is key to understanding ideology. It relies on a sort of as if. Of course, we all know that the king isn't really magic, that the economy is made up and money isn't real, but we all act as if it is. This brings us to Zizek's issues with the ironic cynicism he sees cropping up everywhere. First of all, he makes a good point against the idea that cynicism and irony are good ways to fight totalitarianism because they make it seem ridiculous, which robs the tyrant of their power. Zizek says that that's wrong, because totalitarianism isn't based on facts and logic, but power and coercion. Presenting people in power as ridiculous and stupid is actually great for them, because as long as you're calling them hypocrites or whatever, you're ignoring what they're actually doing. As Jean-Paul Sartre writes in his essay about anti-Semitism, Never believe that anti-Semites are completely unaware of the absurdity of their replies. They know that their remarks are frivolous, open to challenge, but they are amusing themselves, for it is their adversary who is obliged to use words responsibly, since he believes in words. The anti-Semites have the right to play. They even like to play with discourse, for, by giving ridiculous reasons, they discredit the seriousness of their interlocutors. They delight in acting in bad faith, since they seek not to persuade by sound argument, but to intimidate and disconcert. But there's another issue with cynicism. Zizek sees the way people tend to engage in politics from an ironic distance as just a shield for ideology. Remember that for Zizek, belief is what you do. So when someone says something like, yeah, you can steal more by owning a bank than by robbing one, but like, isn't upset by that, they aren't free from ideology. In fact, they're more in it than ever. Zizek sees this ironic distance, which, to be clear, I'm absolutely guilty of, as a problem because the classic Marxist way of fighting ideology is to critique it and show the distance between the truth and the mask that's over top of it. But cynicism is basically saying that they see that distance, but choose the mask anyway. And so, to see what an alternative to this cynicism might look like, let's take a look at what utopianism is all about. <laughs> By the way, it was really funny researching this video because utopianism is like wildly unpopular. It's basically the millennials of critical theory. <laughs> also, I was talking to a friend of mine once who works in a restaurant with a bunch of Zoomers, and he was like, man, the boomers are out to get us, Gen X is out to get us, now Gen Z is out to get us. The only people you can trust are the ones who remember 9-11, but not very well. No, but utopianism definitely has a bad name. On the right, this is because during the Cold War it became a buzzword, basically meaning totalitarianism. On the left, however, some Marxists have criticized it, arguing that it's a distraction from serious analysis of material conditions. Now, I'm planning to push back on both of these arguments, but first, I should probably clarify exactly what we're talking about here. But I'm not going to. Instead of defining our terms like a little academically responsible goody two-shoes, I am at all times wearing exactly three shoes and only one goes on my foot. We're going to be starting from Bloch's extremely open-ended definition, which in her book Utopia's Method, Ruth Levitas summarized as utopia being, quote, an expression of a desire for a better way of living and being. Beyond that, I'll be elaborating further as we go, but a big part of this video is just going to be grappling with what Utopia is or should be. 
Something I will say, which I'll be explaining more throughout the video, is what utopianism is not, which is a blueprint for the future. This is where a lot of the criticisms that utopianism is a recipe for totalitarianism come from, and kind of fair enough, right? Planning out every aspect of a society and expecting that to just work out perfectly isn't a great idea, and we can see that play out throughout history. Thankfully, most utopians agree with that criticism. One example of this is Paul Tillich, who was a very cool theology professor at the University of Frankfurt until he was fired in the 40s for not being a Nazi. Cancel culture strikes again. Tillich wrote about the problems of seeing utopia as a blueprint to be followed, pointing out how doing so can lead to totalitarianism when it's enacted, or disillusionment when it isn't. Tillich argued that utopia is inherently transitory, existing purely in the realm of not yet. Because of this transitory nature though, we're destined to be disappointed by utopia if we view it as something achievable, because it isn't. Plus, even if we did achieve it, by that point we'd have our sights set on something else. Instead, we can choose to embrace that transitory aspect of it, and as Levitas argues in Utopia's Method, we can find the true value of Utopia by viewing it... You're never going to guess where this is going to go. As a method. From this perspective, there are a few ways that utopianism is useful. For one thing, it functions as a form of criticism, since any vision of a utopia is, after all, a way of articulating what's wrong with the world as it is. To explain why that's useful, let's come back to another common criticism of utopianism, which we can see in the writings of one of the very first sociologists, Emile Durkheim, who was very clear that he was not a utopian. However, in his book, The Division of Labor and Society, he outlines a very specific vision of his ideal society, and the division of labor therein. <laughs> One of the things that makes Durkheim really interesting to read is how, while the school of thought that's based off of his work is pretty conservative, because of the times he was writing in, as well as just him being a bit of an odd guy, his politics don't really line up very well with what we'd now think of as right or left wing. For instance, he was actually pretty radically opposed to imperialism, but also pretty brutally sexist even by the standards of his time. And so, in the blueprint he lays out for his ideal society, which he's very clear shouldn't be called a utopia, there are some extremely progressive things like abolishing inheritance, but also stuff like abolishing all art that he didn't think was good for society, which was most of it. He can't do that. Like, if I made all the art that I hate illegal, every gallery would be nothing but figurines of Misato Katsuragi. Something that's really funny with Durkheim, though, is that his theory was that societies progress as they increase the specialization of labor. So, like, going from one person making every part of a wagon or something to each part being made by someone who specializes in just that part. This does tend to increase productivity and quality, and in some ways, people having access to better stuff for cheaper can make for a more progressive society. For example, improvements in the ways we make medicine and food generally help everyone. But also, there are still a lot of people who don't have access to medicine or food right now, and any advancements in the ways that we produce those things aren't likely to radically change that or make society more progressive. So I think that's a pretty clear hole in old Durkheim's theory. And while there was plenty of evidence of this while he was alive, instead of admitting that there might be a problem with his theory, our boy Emil basically just did the Principal Skinner meme and argued that his theory was completely correct, but society was wrong. <laughs> Absolutely amazing behavior. He called the ideal world that he was describing the normal development of society, i.e. how society should be if his theory was correct, which it obviously was. And so, instead, what we're living in is an abnormal society, which is developed in the wrong way for 
some reason. <laughs> this is especially funny because Durkheim argued that what he was describing was definitely not a utopia because unlike utopians, he was a very smart politics understander. Basically, for Durkheim, what made something utopian was that it was unrealistic or impossible. Unlike the utopians, Durkheim was advocating for realistic and achievable goals. You know, like the abolition of inheritance and music. But this is one of the reasons why utopia is so useful as a form of criticism. As the French philosopher Miguel Abensur argued, part of the value of utopianism is that it's a form of criticism that estranges us from the familiar and encourages us to imagine what society should be like, free from the bounds of what seems realistic. This isn't to say that there isn't a time and a place where we should be realistic, but also what's considered politically realistic is decided by people in power. And if we go by their rules, then all we'll be able to do is make minor tweaks to the system rather than actually changing it. No revolution ever seemed realistic until it happened, and likewise, there is no realistic path towards adequately addressing climate change. And so, Maybe it's time we start thinking a bit more about what should happen rather than what we've been told could happen. This freedom to imagine that utopianism creates is key to Abensur, who argued that its function is to, quote, teach desire to desire better, to desire more, and above all, to desire in a different way. I think that the funniest episode of My Cat from Hell is the one about City the Kitty. City the Kitty was a stray who was taken in by Lori and Shauna. He now regularly attacks their other cat, Missy, as well as Shauna. City the Kitty scares me because I know that if he can get close enough to me, he will attack me. Which, first of all, I'm sorry, but saying that you're terrified of a cat named City the Kitty is very funny. I guess not everyone's a city person. Also, this is, I think, the most deranged thing I've seen in this show. The way they discipline City the Kitty is by buttering him. For the uninitiated, if you're trying to figure out what that means, it's the most literal option you could have been thinking of. They just wipe the cat down with butter whenever he misbehaves. The other thing that I do is I'll go, I'll get some butter, and I'll rub it on its back. Still licking the butter off. It actually works? Yes, but it only buys time. I just... Imagine the first time they did that, just standing in the kitchen with a stick of butter in one hand and a misbehaving cat in the other, just like, hang on a second, I've got an idea. And then your life just includes picking cat hair out of your breakfast from now on. There's also a really funny bit at the end where Shauna plays Jackson a song that she wrote about City the Kitty, and Jackson's just sitting there looking completely unimpressed. Just like, I love two things in this world, music and cats, and this song is an insult to both. But the best part in this episode is that Lori is so mean to Shauna, just blaming her for this cat attacking her constantly. I'm the one that's always trying to take care of the fights with City the Kitty and Missy. Bad Kitty! Shauna never asked me how she can help deal with City the Kitty and his behavioral problems. Never? No. Well, you play with him, but you don't give me ideas on how to make him a better cat. Just like, you need to pull your weight and start coming up with some ideas here. Is he attacking Missy again? God damn it, where's the butter? But also, they say how they take pictures of City the Kitty. Started taking pictures of him every yeah. day. He started he's posing photogenic. and doing amazing things. Yeah. So we, yeah. we thought, well, he's meant to be in this house. Which, I guess they just post online or something. Really has this energy. I'm so fucking stressed out from running my pet Lizard's Instagram account, I'm about to have a nervous breakdown. I told my therapist, she said, we'll take a break from your pet Lizard's Instagram account. I said, I can't. It's my sole source of income. My fans will comment stuff about how the work I'm doing is important, bringing the lizard, bringing the attention of the lizard community or bringing the lizard's um, 
Bringing the lizard to attention, lizard issues to the forefront. Just unbelievably relatable. My lizard is reality TV. What's yours? But then Lori says, I think the strangest line in the whole show. Even though it may hurt you and even though he scares you, he has come into our lives for a reason. I think eventually someday he's going to be there to be able to change the world in different ways. It's all well and good to theorize that your asshole cat is going to cause world peace, but importantly, the value of utopianism isn't just in theorizing. Bloch himself is very clear about this, arguing that imagining a utopia alone doesn't constitute utopianism. For him, it only becomes utopian when we begin to take steps to turn that utopia we imagined into a reality. Beyond just being a method of criticism, Tristowska argues in Utopia in the Age of Survival that utopianism has always played a role in radical politics, and likewise, as Russell Jacoby claimed in his book The End of Utopia, the decline of utopianism has signaled with it an existential threat to the future of radical leftist political movements. Krasowska argues for a version of utopianism that's less a method and more a form of myth. When I say myth here, I don't mean something that's untrue, but instead like an overarching narrative for people to believe in. She cites the socialist, philosopher, revolutionary, and also the first guy to call himself an anarchist, Pierre Joseph Proudhon, as saying, A revolution is a force against which no other power, divine or human, can prevail, whose nature it is to be strengthened and to grow by the very resistance which it encounters. A revolution may be directed, moderated, slowed down, but like the ancient nemesis, whom neither prayers nor threats could move, the revolution advances, with fatal and somber step over the flowers cast by its devotees, through the blood of its defenders, across the corpses of its enemies. Fucking metal. She also cites the French historian George Sorrel, who wrote the As long as there are no myths accepted by the masses, one may go on talking of revolts indefinitely without ever provoking any revolutionary movement. They allow us to understand the activity, the sentiments, and the ideas of the masses as they prepare themselves to enter on a decisive struggle. The real development of the revolution did not in any way resemble the enchanting pictures which first created the enthusiasm of its first adherents. But without those pictures, would the revolution have been victorious? While neither of these guys thought of themselves as utopians, I think it's very clear that, in their view, all revolutions require a mythology that actually mobilizes people to take action. A mythology based on a belief in a better world at the other side of the revolution. As for where this organizing myth should come from, Tristowska has an interesting take. She argues that our vision of utopianism shouldn't come from the future, but from the past in the form of nostalgia. Nostalgia for sure has a bad name these days. I think particularly in the context of utopianism, where it's generally the territory of people on the right who will post shit like an ad from the 50s or a Roman statue with a vaporwave filter with the caption that reads, this is what they took from us. Like, <laughs> yeah, dude, if it weren't for the pink haired they thems, we'd all be living in an ad for steak knives right now. In a lot of ways, nostalgia kind of reminds me of Marx's example of the king and his subjects. Like, when we're nostalgic for something, it's never actually the thing itself that we miss, but the time when we had it. Like, the best thing about when I was living in my first apartment after graduating from university was, uh, having never been cheated on. The best thing about playing Pokemon Silver on a Game Boy Color was my grandparents being alive. The best thing about 90s cartoons, easy, 9-11 hadn't happened yet. Also, Gargoyles was sick. Still holds up, too. Check it out. Great storylines. Keith David voices Goliath, and it doesn't have that inescapable atmosphere of Islamophobia. <laughs> I think Gargoyles is actually just the exception to that. I do just genuinely miss that show. <laughs> But Tristowska argues for a different kind of nostalgia, one where we look at past leftist movements as our inheritance and a legacy that we have a duty to continue. 
This isn't an argument for just making our own this is what they took from us memes, where instead of Roman busts we use pictures of labor movements, but instead that we should channel this nostalgia for movements of the past by looking at them not as something that we can or should return to, but instead recognize that doing so is impossible, that the past can't be recreated, but it can be surpassed. But this isn't the only reason why utopianism is important right now. Coming back to Bloch, something that's important about him is that as a Marxist Jewish intellectual, he was forced to flee Germany during World War II. In his book, The Heritage of Our Times, he tries to answer the question, why in Germany did fascism win out over socialism? Unsurprisingly, he argues that the answer comes down to utopianism. The book received a fair bit of criticism from other leftist scholars. Walter Benjamin described it as being, Like a great lord who, arriving at the scene of an area devastated by an earthquake, can find nothing more urgent to do than to spread out the Persian carpets, which, by the way, are already somewhat moth-eaten, and to display the somewhat tarnished golden and silver vessels, and the already faded brocade and damask garments which his servants had brought. Oh shit! Classic Benny Mean Burn. But I do think that that's a little bit unfair though. First of all, Bloch responds to his Marxist critics by pointing out that people's desire for a better future is a real thing with real social consequences and it shouldn't be ignored. In fact, that criticism kind of proves his point. He argues that leftists have consistently been more concerned with what he called the cold stream of analysis over the warm stream of desire, and that given the lack of a leftist articulation of what a better future future would look like, reactionaries have been able to step in and fill that role instead. And I think that that's kind of happening again today. You know, say what you will about slogans like, this is what they took from us, or make America great again, but those are actually promising something. This isn't to say that fascism has no competition when it comes to utopia, although the alternative isn't good either. Both Levitas and Tristowska argue that utopianism has been co-opted by capitalism. We see this in things like the lottery, travel commercials, self-help, diets, and fitness, all of which offer a vision of utopia, but crucially, it's achieved not by improving society, but by improving yourself. This is something Bloch warned against too, pointing out that this is a trap we can fall into if we aren't careful, that too often utopia can be, quote, a beautifying mirror which often only reflects how the ruling class wishes the wishes of the poor to be. It is also debatable whether this is utopian at all. The German sociologist Karl Mannheim argued that the opposite of utopia is ideology, that both are distorted visions of the world, but the difference is that the goal of utopia is to change the status quo, whereas the point of ideology is to enforce it. Arguably, this is the biggest threat to utopianism of all, since this ideology makes the hope for a better world purely individualistic. That said, there is a silver lining here. In his book, The Sociology of Emancipation, the French sociologist Luc Boltanski Also, I'm just realizing, there have been so many French theorists in this video, and I just wanted to say, I'm sorry, and I'll try to do better. In the time between this and my next video, I'm really going to try to listen and hold space for discussions, as long as those discussions aren't in French. Anyways, Boltanski argues that what's so crucial about utopianism is that it bridges the gap between the micro and the macro, between individuals and systems. Through utopianism, people can come to articulate their problems not as personal grievances, but as social issues requiring political solutions. Like, if we ask a 30-year-old with back pain and fucked up knees to imagine a world where they didn't have those, that world is probably going to involve greater access to healthcare and workers being treated better. Boltanski writes, 
Utopia may do more than articulate through compensatory fantasies the unsatisfactory nature of present reality. As critique, it foregrounds and makes explicit this inadequacy, identifying the source of dissatisfaction as something more systemic, more general than one's own place in the world. A sociological imagination is brought into play and personal troubles become public issues. Utopia's importance lies in its capacity to embody hope, rather than simply desire and to inspire the pursuit of a world transformed. Who's the best cat in Ontario? It's you, Jackie. It's you. And I think that that's where we need to go from here. In a sense, I do think there's some cause for optimism in all of this. If people's two main choices for imagining a better future are shitty ad campaigns or losers who are still triggered by 100-year-old modern art, I don't think it's crazy to think that now's a good time for the left to step in and be filled with people's hopes once again. And listen, I'm as guilty as anyone of being cynical and focusing too heavily on criticism, but we won't have a future unless we're able to earnestly imagine one that's actually worth fighting for. Hey, so first of all, thank you for making it to the end of this video, and uh, sorry for taking so long to make this one. Uh, as I said, I've been going through some stuff, and then to top it all off, while I was working on this, my friend Nick died. Now is the time when I would normally plug my Patreon since donations through that allow me to take a bit longer on videos sometimes, and I'm very grateful to everyone who supports it, but apparently one of the last things that Nick did before he died was donate to Planned Parenthood, and so it would mean a lot to me if instead of giving to me, you donated to them. Not only because that's an important thing to do right now, but also to honor his memory. I'll put a thing in the description or figure out a way for you to do that easily. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for watching. Held like water in your shaking hands Are all the small defeats a day demand Ten to six or nine to five Trying, dying to survive Never knowing what survival means Leave the apartment to buy alcohol Hung our diplomas on the bathroom wall Pick at the plaster chipped away Space some stunning tooth decay Enlist the cat in the impending class war Let's lay our back Like maybe we shall overcome someday Overcome the stupid things we say Say I needed more than this Say I needed one more kiss We left that light on Somewhere love and justice shines Cynicism falls asleep Tyranny talks to itself